welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this episode, I have the pleasure, distinct pleasure of speaking with Professor Richard Frankel. He's an associate professor of law, but he's also the director of the Federal Litigation and Appeals Clinic at the Drexel University Thomas R. Klein School of Law in Philadelphia, PA. Um, he has written several articles about mandatory arbitration and the Federal Arbitration Act. He also has testified be before Congress and the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, with respect to arbitration and legislation related to mandatory arbitration. Um, I'm assuming the FAIR Act and some of the other legislative initiatives that have been before um, Congress and uh, have not yet kind of made their way all the way through, but nonetheless continue to linger as I fully understand. <laughs> so thank you for taking time with us. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, this is a really important conversation. So what we're gonna talk about in this episode is kind of digging into privacy and confidentiality within arbitration. And kind of before we get into why we should care and what that means, I just kind of want to take a step back. And if you can explain what is the difference between arbitration being private versus arbitration being confidential? Sure. And, and to explain that, I might take even one step further back and, when, and say that when, when you think about um, our legal system and uh, resolving disputes uh, through court, Right? When someone files a, a lawsuit in court claiming that their rights were violated, that is ordinarily in a public proceeding. Um, the, the, the documents that you file are accessible to anyone. Hearings are open to the public. Journalists can cover them and report on them. Um, right? our, our standard conception of our justice system is that it's a public justice system and that there's sunshine there so that everyone can understand what's, what's going on. Uh, arbitration uh, generally is a is a private system, um, and uh, uh, um, yeah, I'm in my wife's office, and I don't know how to how to uh, stop the phone, but uh, it'll stop eventually. Um, so arbitration is a private system in that uh, it it's not open to the public. It's it's designed to be a dispute, ju you know, re uh, just involve the parties to the dispute, the plaintiff and the defendant. Um, so arbitration is a, is a is a is a private form of dispute resolution. Um, it does it takes place behind closed doors in the sense that um, it just involves the parties to dispute the plaintiff and the defendant and whoever the arbitrators arbitrator or arbitrators are who are going to decide it. So it's not open to the public in the same way. Um, that doesn't automatically make it confidential, right? The parties might still be able to talk to other people about the arbitration, publicize it, um, but in many cases. Uh, the same contract that includes the arbitration clause requiring the parties to give up their right to go to court will also have a confidentiality provision or in some cases even a gag order um, that will prohibit the parties from saying anything about the dispute, sharing inf prohibiting them from sharing information from, with other uh, people who may be similarly affected by the same type of misconduct that's being alleged in that particular case. Yeah, that's an important distinction, though. Um, I had written an article many years ago about that distinction because many times it's assumed that a proceeding is going to be confidential, but that is not necessarily true unless, of course, you have an agreement, which, you know, the parties may also end up signing a confidentiality agreement at the beginning of an arbitration proceeding, which I've seen them do. And, of course, that has certain implications. Um, what are some of the concerns, especially from a policy standpoint, perhaps focusing on employment, for example, employment arbitration. Yeah, well, you can see some of the concerns, particularly around cases, um, when you think of the Me Too movement and cases involving sexual harassment uh, in the workplace, um, there, uh, uh, Gretchen Carlson, for example, a prominent uh, newscaster with Fox News, uh, alleged that um, she uh, had been sexually harassed by Roger Ailes um, and could not bring that uh, based on her contract, they tried to really prevent her from even talking about it, trying to force that case into arbitration. And with many people, if there's many situations where if someone has uh, abused or harassed one person, they've harassed others. And so when you allow this information to be kept quiet, that allows the person to continue harassing other people um, or mistreating other people or discriminating against other people uh, without anybody finding out what happened. That happened, Bill O'Reilly is another example where that happened and there were multiple victims um, 
the head of the clothing company, American Peril, uh, same sort of situation where he harassed or allegedly harassed a number of people and over a course of 10 years and no one really knew about it for a long time because uh, the cases were either forced into arbitration, they had confidentiality provisions or other uh, similar types of situations. Whereas if those cases had been able to be brought in court, um, uh, they could find out about those uh, much more quickly. That's such a great point. I mean, it's so, because when you think about how do you prove a case, right? So if you're the next claimant, how do you prove a case of a pattern, especially if you don't have access to any of the information? Exactly, right? So you can't, and, and then um, some, per, some arbitration clauses will actually uh, prevent you from cooperating with other litigants who have been in, in similar situation or prevents you from finding out that even you've been wrong in the first place. Another example uh, for the last few years uh, is the case of Wells Fargo, uh, where they were uh, fabricating client accounts um, uh, for people with accounts at the bank. And many people, it, some people knew about it as early as 2013 and tried to file suit, but they couldn't talk about it based on their arbitration agreement. And then so misconduct continued to occur and more and more people continued to be harmed until it finally was made public. And it was making it public that uh, led to taking action to try and stop the problem. Right, yeah, I mean, it seems to me there's a lot of different areas, you know, warranty, um, you know, consumer warranties, things involving health and safety, um, food safety, also employment. I mean, these are a lot of areas that, that might be relevant. Well, it seems as though right now, obviously, the Me Too movement is a very apropos um, example, certainly from the headlines, but also with policing issues. How do you see privacy coming into play or confidentiality, better said, um, being relevant with respect to claims against police officers? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. And I, the, the, there's a system of arbitration for um, discipline often for disciplinary action taken against police officers uh, who commit con misconduct uh, or conduct violations. And that's a little bit of a different sort of arbitration than you see in the, in the consumer or employment uh, context. But I think the similarity is that um, often it's very, very difficult to find out which police officers have been, ever been accused of misconduct, how those claims have been resolved, um, and the arbitration system there also tends to hamstring um, or stymie reformist um, police chiefs who really want to sort of weed out uh, misconduct, history of racism in the police force. Um, uh, uh, and often people who commit misconduct get reinstated through that arbitration system. Uh, so it does, it does, there is a bit of a privacy um, aspect there in, in the difficulty of finding out what's going on. Yeah, I imagine. Well, like you said, this is different. I mean, now we're talking mainly probably um, this would be under a collective bargaining agreement in sort of a labor setting. Um, how do you know what some of these collective bargaining agreements say with respect to arbitration and confidentiality in the proceedings? I'm less familiar with the um, with how things work in the collective bargaining area than in the, and I'm a little less concerned about abuses in that system, putting the police aside, because I feel like they're, at least the union hat, the union is looking out for its employees, um, and they have strong bargaining power with the company, uh, that they can really try to design a system of rules that I think will be fair, uh, fairer for, for both sides, whereas for an individual consumer or an employee who's agreeing to work for Fox News or American Apparel, they may not even know that there's an arbitration clause in their contract, let alone what the implications of right. it are. Right, especially if the you other, have an idea, yeah. And I think the other important difference is, particularly with employment, with if you're um, uh, with race discrimination, sex discrimination, um, or other misbehavior in the workplace, it inherently involves uh, a power dynamic. There's a there's a group with a, histo a historic um, experience of discrimination, of uh, not being given equality uh, in the workplace. Or, or uh, in uh, or other aspects of, of life, and you have the people in power in uh, in the office who um, may not be a one to one, uh, you know, may not reflect the diversity of that particular workplace. Um, and then they're saying to you, um, 
when you when you when you think something's happened to you, we are going to resolve this privately, secretly, using the same power structures that we have built at this company and that have been used across society to to uh, perpetuate that form of of discrimination. And for someone who's who's been a victim of that power dynamic uh, for so long, or is part of a group that's been a victim of that power dynamic, uh, it's secrecy doesn't seem to perpetuate the sense of trust or confidence that you want in, in that kind of system, but may actually just reinforce the stereotypes that have been creating the problems in the first place. So one of the arguments I've seen um, with respect to employment arbitration in particular, um, some, I know that at least um, to a limited extent, I know doesn't the American Arbitration Association publish um, arbitration awards to a limited extent? Do you think that helps at all um, to open kind of the privacy lens or to kind of open the box or get some information? Do you think it's helpful? I think more disclosure is always better. And uh, some states have certain laws that require a little bit of, of disclosure. Um, but it's, it, it, and they might be useful to a certain degree, um, but it, it can be very hard to figure out what was the nature of that particular dispute? Was it resolved by settlement? Uh, did, who, how do you decide who won and, and who lost? Uh, the information is pretty opaque. Um, I think what's also useful is when the arbitration providers um, or other companies would be willing to open up their data for study by academics and other individuals who want to really take a close look. And when there have been studies, they really suggest that arbitration seems to be a more favorable uh, venue for the employer than the employee compared to going to court. Certainly transparency um, can be incredibly helpful for a lot of different reasons, trust, as you mentioned, um, but also assessing fairness, right? And, and actually looking at the, the results of these arbitrations. Is there anything else that you might recommend or that you're thinking about in terms of ways to address this kind of problem, really, of keeping confidential, especially when you're talking about things as, as important as discrimination cla claims and harassment claims? I mean, the, I think the, the biggest thing, I mean, I wish that companies would uh, be so uh, stringent in the kind of confidentiality provisions and gag order clauses that they put in their arbitration agreements. But the, I think the biggest issue is that at the, the, at the time, this is just another provision in a long contract that someone is signing um, that it's very difficult to understand the implications of that contract at the time you're signing it. Uh, especially when you need a job and you're, and, and, and you're getting hired. You don't know that there's going to be a dispute. And most of us don't assume we're going to end up suing our employer. Um, and so I think that the biggest way to sort of resolve some of these things is not to require arbitration in the first place. If after the dispute arises, both parties decide they want to resolve this by arbitration and they go in eyes wide open, um, then they can decide to do that. And as you mentioned, sometimes people opt for confidentiality at the beginning of a dispute. But that's when they should be able to make that decision um, and not at the outset when uh, you're being forced to sign it as part of a contract that you have no power to negotiate. Well, and of course, we always say that um, arbitration is supposed to be a consensual creature of, of contract. So, um, you know, why not allow for it to actually be consensual when both sides know what they're getting into, right? So, and you know, there it could be, I mean, on the flip side, let's look at the positives, right? So if we want to kind of be balanced and thinking about arbitration, you know, arbitration might in fact be a more efficient and fair way of resolving um, different consumer or, or, or employment um, claims, um, depending on the facts and circumstances. In fact, the employee may, might actually want it to be quiet or it might involve intellectual property or things that they don't really want to have out in the open. Um, but I guess the real question is allowing for it to be consensual. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, a very good way of putting it, right? I mean, plenty of people might want, maybe both sides don't want anybody to know about this. Maybe it involves embarrassing details, right? I mean, the, your discrimination is a very personal uh, thing that someone, you know, no one should have to experience. And that's, it's, you know, maybe someone doesn't want to have to expose that to the world. Um, yeah. I could understand why people would want to keep their claims private. And they should be allowed to have that, as you said, consensual choice at the time the dispute arises. Right, and real choice, right? Yeah. Choice when you know what you're getting yourself into, um, which is a great point. So thank you for taking this time with me today. This has been a really interesting discussion about privacy and confidentiality and arbitration. 
with Professor Frankel. I'm super thankful. Thank you for having the, taking the time with us today. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.